Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to uh, Thinking Through Arts and Design, a course that I, Greg Niemeyer, am happy to teach with uh, Professor Lisa Wymore, my colleague from Theater, uh, Dance, and Performance Studies. Uh, as usual, our guest lectures on Thursdays are open to the public, and it's my great honor today to introduce our colleague, Dr. Pablo Gonzalez. And uh, Dr. Pablo Gonzalez is a professor of ethnic studies at UC Berkeley, and he actually is a, a graduate of our own institution, uh, Go Bears, undergrad at Berkeley and Chicago, Chicano Studies, and then also um, got his grad degree uh, and doctorate from UT Austin in anthropology. And uh, his past research addressed the effects of the post-2008 housing crisis on Latino and Black families. And his current research addresses race and the digital divide, and uh, specifically on campus, and uh, is something that um, we always imagine not being there, but in fact, it is always present as a factor that not everybody has access to information uh, the same way and uh, small differences in time and, and, and ways of searching online uh, end up creating huge uh, social divides in their consequence. And so really glad that uh, uh, Dr. Pablo Gonzalez is studying these kinds of things. Uh, today, he's going to present um, on uh, two efforts uh, to uh, <clears throat> collaborate on uh, uh, documenting documenting uh, uh, recent plywood murals in downtown Oakland, but also to focus on uh, how history of campus is shared and how the history of campus is told. And he's going to introduce um, uh, new ways of conceiving of a uh, campus tour uh, that uh, um, unpack different layers of history that are often um, silenced or uh, avoided. And uh, so these kinds of um, works are um, indicate a lot of solidarity with artists who uh, uh, present uh, different views of uh, life and uh, who present uh, social mobilizations against systemic racism and violence. And uh, so with that, I'd really um, like to share my enthusiasm for Dr. Pablo Gonzalez and his uh, speech today. And uh, if we were in a big auditorium, we would give you a rousing round of applause. But in this case, we just have to uh, uh, do with a simple hand clap and uh, declare the session open. And welcome, Pablo. How are you doing today? Wonderful, Greg. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, this is, I know, the second time that I've uh, spoken to your class, uh, something that I will always welcome and uh, and accept uh, the kind invitation just because I know uh, it's a matter of thinking through ideas. And um, in fact, um, I found so much of the engagement last uh, year um, in talking about the Black Lives Matter mural project that uh, myself and students um, have been working on and continue to still uh, try to fine tune uh, the questions asked and some of the uh, just insights to be helpful in in uh, in how that can materialize, especially here on campus, uh, where universities across the country, but also in the world, are sites of um, both uh, memory but also of erasure of of exclusion. Um, and you know, one of the projects that I've been thinking about with my with my ethnic studies changemaker team is uh, the question of, of memory um, and how we tell, for instance, certain stories, um, um, what stories are not told. So in this context, uh, the question of uh, official tours, tours that you give um, on campus. And so I, I say this with uh, a little bit of, uh, of having walked through campus several times and seen what many of you have probably seen, which is it might have actually made made all the difference in you coming to Berkeley, which is the the official campus tour. People take you around, show you the buildings, and so forth. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to stop my PowerPoint just to show you some slides, and then at the end, uh, prototypes, uh, really rough prototypes that my students put together uh, with some audio um, embedded in them of of some of the things that we're working on that we'll perfect and and. You know, in, in not too long distance, you'll be able to see uh, distant time. You'll be able to see them in, I think, a more polished form, but some something for you to conceptualize and maybe think through. So I'm going to share screen. Oh, hold on a sec before you do. And I just wanted to because I'm, I'm, I'm right here with you and uh, on, on campus, uh, you know, uh, on, on the on how campus represents itself on that question. And right. obviously, I, it was to be a good moment to acknowledge that. Um, Right now, if we wanted to do a campus tour, we'd have to cross a picket line. And I think you've, right. 
you've you've seen that in person and and I wanted to know if you want to uh, maybe say something about uh, the current situation as it stands live right now in 2022 uh, and uh, how, how, what are we going to uh, how are we going to resolve this situation and uh, what have you observed on the ground? Well, that's a, I think that's a great thing. You know, as a as a continuing lecturer and as a, a faithful uh, uh, union uh, unionized uh, lecturer in terms of. Um, how this uh, university operates and what how parts of the question of memory and erasure has to do with the neoliberal university. The intention around how space is ordered and also how we think about, especially um, the, the, the university has a business that students now feel that uh, the buildings themselves are the lure to come to a place like Berkeley or that um, the stories that are told about the university as a place of uh, even diversity and inclusion of, of can become ways in which the university intentionally erases uh, stories of struggle, um, especially when it comes, for instance, to labor rights, uh, but not only labor rights, civil rights, um, uh, to look at um, some of the more impactful union strikes, but also student strikes that have been on this campus. So for instance, some of the images I'll show or some of the parts I'll show is around the ethnic studies uh, strike of 1969 and 1999, which were important for the survival of ethnic studies and its origin in 1969. So when thinking about right now at this moment and for students to, to try to better understand uh, why your graduate student instructors um, and researchers are striking, we think that who, who makes up the university, as I tell my students, that uh, when we ask how the university works, we do not ask the chancellor. Seems kind of counterintuitive, but it, you don't ask the chancellor. You don't even ask the University of California president. You ask custodial staff. You ask the service workers. You ask your graduate student instructors how it works. Why? Because I think they see it on the ground uh, more than anybody. Uh, your graduate student instructors see it in terms of having to grade, but also mentor you. Many of them write your letters of recommendation. Many of them will are the inspiration for you to continue your higher education into graduate school. And so graduate student instructors who, uh, the, some of them will not go into the professoriate, but those that do um, deserve all the respect um, and dignity that we show all other workers on this campus that also um, should have liberal, wage, liberal wages and, and also um, be, given all the opportunity to succeed in, in, in not only their work, but in their life purpose. So right now as we speak, we're still in now uh, day four of a strike um, and it's a system-wide strike, which you know, for us is around what will be the markers and memory of this large strike, the largest strike uh, that we've seen in UC history around labor, uh, what will be how we remember this? Uh, and, and that has to do much with the, the current struggle, but also prior struggles that give it, it um, that circulation. Thank you. I really appreciate um, that. Okay, onwards to the slides, yes? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. And, you know, the tentative title as we've been working on is this other campus. And when we say other campus, uh, we the other here, represents um, a campus that is within a campus. That is, this official campus holds so many stories, so many uh, understandings of, of what it means to uh, different uh, communities on this campus that to conceptualize another campus is to uh, be in dialogue and to start uh, discussing uh, and conceptualizing a campus that can hold and and creates the place of encounter for, for these many worlds that we see on the Berkeley campus. And I feel like through augmented reality, uh, we've, we've been able to at least um, start thinking through ideas of how to tell our, our stories, um, how to uh, make visible in an, in a, almost an invisible way, uh, because augmented reality uses uh, a form of media that um, is, you know, without a phone or a tablet. In this case, uh, you won't be able to necessarily see it. But how to make it a, a clandestine story? How to be able to tell stories 
um, of a campus that holds a particular official story to its origin, but also to the many functions of, of different buildings in terms of where disciplines um, operate, uh, where research is conducted and so forth. So how to be able to give a camp campus tour like this? And for me, again, as I'll mention throughout, uh, it comes from being someone who was born and raised in Berkeley and understands, I think, a particular relationship to the campus um, in regards to uh, being raised in West Berkeley and also in the greater East Bay in Richmond, California, and seeing the camp Neely, but not really knowing what goes on um, in the area that we know as the Camp Um, This also, I think, plays a part in how we think about and pay attention, especially to um, native voices, especially the Ohlone, uh, Chochenyo Ohlone peoples and other peoples, uh, that um, original peoples of this land in their call for uh, the decolonization of the university, but also uh, decoloni decolonization of land. And uh, this, I think, operates in such a way that we think about buildings, we think about monuments, we think about how we walk through campus uh, and what memories come to, um, to our minds if we are coming back after graduating, um, if we're coming back after several years, um, or even if we are currently students and walking through campus um, and feel like we're familiar with the campus. What makes us familiar? Um, and what stories have we um, uh, ourselves come to understand that make up the university? So those questions are something that I think have given uh, light to, uh, at least to this particular project. Um, and it's partly because especially in ethnic studies and in uh, Chicanx and Latinx studies, we talk about the question of um, a particular historical production of being produced um, or subjects being produced as a people without a history, as I um, teach in my classes. What does it mean to be a people without a history? That is, when you come to a university, especially um, in the 1960s and 70s, but even today, and the curriculum does not reflect your uh, story or the story of your community where you might come from, or those stories that have been told about your community often reflect um, a particular sociological perspective or anthropological perspective of your community that just doesn't hold any weight, that still continues the kind of um, colonial uh, construct of your community. So the, the project in ethnic studies is to surface unsettle these stories, to surf surface new stories, or to resurface ones that have been lost due to uh, forced assimilation or uh, just due to neglect and erasure, per you know, intentional neglect and erasure. And at the same time, uh, as Greg mentioned, I went to the University of Texas, Austin for grad school. And if you've ever been to the University of Texas at Austin, prior to probably, I would say, this past decade, you would have noticed um, in walking through the different plazas or malls, as they call them, uh, that lead up to the main administrative building and the tower, which is kind of the same um, or resembles the Campanile in a way, that you would have seen a lot of statues, especially monuments, uh, in this case, two Confederate uh, soldiers and figures. Uh, they all point south or, or towards the capital, but also south. And what does it mean to, if you're a Mexican uh, or if you're uh, African-American in Texas and you're a student at the University of Texas, or you're just visiting as many high school students do today, I saw several high school uh, tours, and you're walking through the plaza, through the malls, and you see the statue of, for instance, uh, Confederate President Je Jefferson Davis, like when I was a grad, stu grad student, I would often see. And for me, it was a sense that these statues, as I also tell my students, um, they're more than just uh, launch pads or, or landing points for pigeons, uh, especially for pigeons to kind of drop their bombs onto these statues, but more so they, they hold meaning, we, especially you put you place meaning on these statues. There's an intentional meaning, especially when you're talking about 
um, the South, uh, Texas being the South, but it also being the Southwest, um, in relationship to its two largest populations of uh, racialized non-whites, uh, non-white communities, uh, African-Americans and um, the Mexican origin community. And so part of it is for me, thinking how social movements um, is within and outside of the university have been able to impact uh, and dislodge the spatial location of the university, and especially what we term or we, we consider to be uh, monuments, uh, places of meaning and importance, uh, especially of historical figures, um, both um, that uh, hold controversy in regards to their history of furthering colonial violence, either through material or epistemic at an epistemic level. Um, that is through their writings um, or through their actual actions um, it, as you know, generals of war, et cetera. So this has to do, I think, as much as uh, we're, we're seeing social movements outside of the university and within it um, congeal and come together to talk about the question of de what does it mean to decolonize the university? And in this context, um, for me, uh, this has to do in particular over the last 12 or so years around the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement and the impact that it's had, um, especially in universities across the United States, uh, to reconsider many of its historical monuments. Uh, monuments uh, that we've seen, for instance, in the renaming of buildings here on this campus, um, but also um, in regards to a dialogue and discussion around uh, uh, this kind of question of memory and counter memory. So this is one of the questions I think that I've been thinking through. And it, because this is both within the university and outside, um, last year I presented um, it in this uh, same forum, a project that my students and myself worked on in the summer of 2021 around mapping in particular these uh, uh, circulations of struggle, especially when it comes to uh, Black lives um, and the struggle for Black lives. In particular, um, the 2020 George Floyd protests um, that uh, went across the United States, but in particular in Oakland, California. And one of the things that we uh, did was um, using much of the photography, uh, much of the photographs collected um, during the protests uh, of, of plywood murals, murals that were painted, uh, painted on plywood and placed um, on windows in downtown businesses or, or shops and so forth. Um, and telling the story of, of what does it mean to uh, whitewash um, this uh, explosion of creativity around uh, uh, insurgency that we saw. And the Black Lives Matter art, uh, AR mural project uh, uh, was something that students put together interviewing some of the muralists themselves, creating several podcasts with the muralists, and then uh, creating a kind of map of where many of these murals used to be because there is an intention here that in a place like an urban landscape like downtown Los, uh, Los Angeles or even downtown Oakland, we will find that at some point these plywood um, uh, installations would come down. It just was something that shops or people were gonna end up bringing down once they felt things were quote unquote safe. And so what we decided to do was use augmented reality through um, a, an app uh, that is now, I think, used for so many different uh, purposes called Artivive um, and use it to uh, make a statement around whitewashing. And the concept, concept of whitewashing is something uh, known to many artists, especially graffiti artists, uh, who paint the la urban landscapes of urban cities across the world, um, that when they put up graffiti, for instance, um, whether it be the shop owner or the city, uh, uh, administration, uh, they paint over it with white paint. So whitewashing is a term usually for the painting over of something in that sense. So in an urban landscape, what does that mean? So this project was something that we created um, to, to respond to that, uh, to show the work of these artists, the amazing work of artists, both young and old, uh, seasoned and kind of beginner 
um, to, to be in solidarity with uh, black folks across the diaspora. So not only in the United States, but across the world. And uh, this is just an example of one of them. This is uh, one of the murals that was uh, painted by uh, pieces by PZ. Uh, and we used the art of vibe to, um, to, to include in it uh, into this screen, uh, TV screen, a uh, video of the marches. So I'll just play it real quick. And uh, you can't see it here, but the image, anywhere you go in the world, that image, um, if you point the Art of Vive app from a phone or tablet, um, it, will, it will show this augmented reality of this video. So we thought it was not only pretty neat and, and cool looking, but it also made a statement. That is, uh, students who developed this um, or, or decided to uh, put this video we're saying, you know, because the television um, is a medium by which we hear news, but also um, see the lack of news or attention to protests, for instance, uh, decided to put this uh, short video just to give a sense of uh, the nights of protests and insurgency that happen all over the United States. And part of here also I wanted to talk about is the sense that um, this project that we did around the Black Lives uh, Matter um, murals and the George Floyd protests are something that uh, we can refer to here as hidden transcripts. That is, uh, narratives and stories. I put cuentos, you know, different forms of stories, oral histories, uh, gossips, and archives that are often neglected or not thought of as official archives. Uh, there's even a politics behind the archive, right? If it's at a library in the university, then it's a much more official, uh, more recognized archive than if uh, you, for instance, talk about the archive that your grandparents hold of hidden uh, of le of love letters or of pictures of having um, of of their lives prior maybe to coming to this country, things of that nature. Um, and we want to talk about these hidden transcripts in a way of how they're usually not spoken about or again viewed as valid forms of knowledge but instead how they give us an entirely un different understanding of history uh one that uh stems from below one that is in many ways clandestine and can give us meaning um to experiences that we might not have considered um or that uh reflect and resonate with our own experiences um and so these can include, as I'm sure you all know, can include diaries, newspapers, uh, speeches, um, famous speeches, conferences, um, especially here at the University of California. Um, we have, for instance, the famous conference uh, by critical resistance in the late 90s that led to um, some important dialogues over the abolition of prisons. Uh, so you have these moments, I think, where you can find uh, these hidden transcripts especially at a university like uh, University of California, Berkeley, where um, so much is around the question of knowledge. But then there's also a political imperative within this concept of hidden transcripts um, that we must do the work of finding these transcripts and we must do the work of not only finding them but showing inherent contradictions, but also of um, building it as a, uh, as a form of dialogue with communities or individuals that uh, might not know very much about uh, these particular types of transcripts. And so this is where this uh, question of touring Berkeley comes. Uh, this morning, I noticed several tours of Berkeley. I tried to kind of eavesdrop on what the uh, uh, students like yourselves, maybe you work in one of these uh, official tours for the campus and what they're saying. And I'm not there to be critical of it, but just to listen more uh, if, like as if I'm doing ethnographic work uh, around um, who the audience is, you know, if they're um, high schoolers or uh, parents uh, who are bringing their children to get to know the campus, and then the person who's giving the tour. And, I, you know, in listening to it, uh, everybody has their own style, their own kind of charisma in giving the tours. But also, there is some official 
aspects of it, right? You have to know um, the history of certain buildings, the, the, his, the history of certain areas on campus um, to give, and even some statistics or something to give um, and make it interesting for people around this official tour. And so part of, I, you know, I thought this tour, how would you give this kind of tour to a, a student um, at a high school in East Oakland or in East Palo Alto um, or from San Jose, right? Or from somewhere outside of the United States. And what does it mean to them being in close proximity to the campus and yet being so far away in terms of um, the, the, the very nature of the admissions process, um, the way that their high school, um, where it's viewed in a, in a hierarchy of high schools and curriculum um, and courses offered that would um, allow for them or help them, for instance, to enroll in a university like the University of California, Berkeley. And what does it mean to tell them this story? Do they embrace the story of the University of California as theirs, as a public institution? Um, and what's left out of these tours? So these are some of the questions that I thought about in regards to the tour. And then I thought, you know, I have these kind of mad scientist ideas sometimes of like, what does an other tour look like? And because I've been working with different augmented reality applications, one of them being uh, through the Adobe Creative Cloud, um, Adobe Arrow, I wanted to see if we could create um, or start to conceptualize uh, a tour that one can take, whether individually or collectively, using your phone or a tablet, that could give you uh, a different story of the campus, of uh, different historical moments, of um, locations where important events happen but are not necessarily a part of the tour. And what could that do to reshape our understanding of the university? So not necessarily using Artivive, even though Artivive here, I think would also serve as a great medium, um, but using Adobe Arrow, um, how to create this. And so we've been working on this um, and it's really rough at this point, but we, we wanted to share with you um, some of these uh, different, I think, uh, projects. Now we did several scenes, sh very short scenes uh, where we did this. One of them is in front of California Hall, which is where the, uh, the chancellor uh, works out of. And there we um, created just a quick scene of the Third World Liberation Front 1999 strike, which is the strike that um, led to the formation of the Multicultural Community Center here on campus, the Center for Race and Gender, um, the hiring of um, over eight faculty in the Department of Ethnic Studies, um, and so many more important uh, achievements uh, around this uh, strike. And uh, one of the main parts was a hunger strike by students on this campus and a student at the San Francisco State campus. And here, the 99 strike speaks to a much a longer legacy in genealogy around the history of ethnic studies. And so we used, for instance, just a couple of images of the Third World Liberation Front student strike, the largest student strike in US history of 1969. And this strike led to the formation of uh, what we now know as the Department of Ethnic Studies, uh, even though it were, they called for a college in ethnic studies at the time, um, and the formation of the programs, Native American studies, uh, Chicano studies, Asian American studies, and so forth. So that was another part that we wanted to tell. And then we chose one that we were inspired by um, that another project that's doing similar work, the um, Black Lives at Cal project is doing around um, the black, uh, black experiences of students across the history of this campus. And uh, one of the uh, moments that they chose was the May 17th, 1967, uh, Martin Luther King speech at Sproul Hall, I mean, at Sproul Plaza. So this is something that a lot of students might not know, but uh, MLK, a year before his assassination, um, spoke in front of Berkeley students um, in Sproul Plaza, uh, Upper Sproul, 
um, and what that might look like in terms of, again, giving this tour. And then finally, a mural, a mural that was a part of the um, demands of the 1999 strike that um, has yet to be yet to find a home on the campus be, due to its size and it being approved to be placed up. Um, a mural that was done by a local, uh, very important, I think, uh, art troupe, uh, uh, Trust Your Struggle, that, that do a tremendous amount of work, especially in the community um, and uh, transnationally in communities across the world. Um, and that uh, painted this beautiful mural around the history of ethnic studies on the campus. So what I'm going to do is show you a couple of these videos that I just took um, just yesterday and today of what we're working on. And again, they're really rough, but just to give you a, a sense of uh, when uh, what it might look like um, using the Adobe Arrow. And this one's one, this one is in front of uh, California Hall, um, and it's the 99 strike. The volume level you might have to raise just because, again, when you embed the audio. And this poem pleads for Chicano studies and Asian American studies and Native American studies and African American studies. And this poem written on my body will not stop because you cannot put pain holds on this poem. You cannot drag this poem through the night without it getting louder. without it getting stronger. You cannot arrest this poem without it growing bolder. I wanted to give you a poem, but I offer you my body instead. The Third World Liberation Front was revived in 1999 with the Multiracial Coalition of Students organizing a hunger strike to push for more so uh, I'll continue playing it, but I wanted to just point out that that first poem, uh, the, the reading of the poem uh, during one of the uh, rallies in front of um, California Hall uh, plays upon you uh, starting the uh, Adobe Arrow augmented reality. Yeah, that is this particular scene uh, using a QR code, and I could provide those to Greg so that you all can see them and go to uh, California Hall and place this as well, that it plays the speech, it plays the poem. And then some of these uh, different images, you can actually tap on them on your phone and then it'll play in a different audio. So the next audio right now that you're going to hear is part of uh, tapping on one of the one of the images and it gives you a sense of what you're seeing. Oh, pa Pablo, before you, you go ahead. Yeah. Um, may I ask you a question? That sure. was a very powerful poem that you shared there, a powerful speech. Do you have any records as to who spoke and where that poem might be found in print? Yes, yeah, so it's it, it was a graduate student um, in the Department of Ethnic Studies uh, during the during uh, right during the time that uh, negotiations were happening um, uh, in the in the at almost at the tail end of the hunger strike. Um, I'll get you the name because we have all the references uh, on a sheet um, that we put together. I'll get you the name of, of the person who read the poem um, so that you'll have that handy. Yeah. Thank you. Studies programs following a budget cut that resulted in the cutting of many ethnic studies courses. The Third World Liberation Front presented eight demands to the university administration seeking to expand ethnic studies. Six students were involved in a hunger strike outside of California Hall, while students set up a 24-hour camp drawing hundreds of supporters every day. The ethnic studies faculty, including Professor Ron... And that's Tatana, the picture of the hunger Professor strikers. Carlos Munoz ...and Professor Lane Kim joined in supporting the students. On the fourth night of the hunger strike, the University of California Police Department raided the camp and arrested 83 protesters. After eight days, the university administration agreed to seven of the eight student demands and conditionally to the eighth demand. The strike resulted in the creation of the Multicultural Community Center, the Center for Race and Gender, and more faculty hires in the Department of Ethnic Studies. 
So the next one I'll play is one that I took this morning. We try to figure it out. This one was a lot more difficult because one of the things you have to figure out with Adobe Arrow here is distance. And so if maybe last week you might have seen us actually with a with a uh, tape, a measuring tape, uh, try to measure from Bancroft and Telegraph all the way to Sather Gate, uh, trying to figure out um, the location and where to put some of these images. But this one I just took uh, this morning uh, of uh, the Martin Luther King speech and just an image of the TWF. I also included uh, some UAW student strikers uh, that we placed right there just for us to, again, in terms of memory, this is the last couple of days, right? Your, your graduate instructors and so forth um, striking. So put a couple picket signs. And this is where you can start seeing the MLK, uh, just a, a Getty image of the uh, of the MLK speech and uh, uh, Martin Luther King. And what we're gonna, what you can do here is, in a sense, you can uh, tap on the Martin Luther King image, and it'll play a little bit about the description of the speech. The aim is to build a powerful peace block. On May 17, 1967, 7,000 people gathered on Sproul Plaza to hear Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak. The Interfraternity Council president at the time, Dick Beers, invited Dr. King to campus and recalls their interactions being very casual. Dr. Martin Luther King addressed the Vietnam War and captivated the attention of students who gathered to hear him speak. This was one of Dr. King's final major speeches in the Bay Area before he was assassinated the following year in April of 1960. So as you could tell, like you could add audio, you could you could give a sense of the speech. Um, students can find links um, or website links to further information. Um, so you can embed many of them. And this last image um, is a famous image of the Third World Liberation Front um, showing locked arms of some of the protesters um, and marchers um, uh, fighting for Black studies on this campus, Chicano studies, Asian American studies, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, what we aim to do here is to, in a sense, give some place like Sproul Plaza, um, the, the, the very nature of a gallery in a sense, where people can roam around the plaza and find different moments that um, have happened on the campus that can give you a sense of a history that otherwise you wouldn't know. Now, for instance, think about it right now. If you go right now on Sproul Plaza, you'll find barricades uh, due to, um, you know, uh, the, the anticipation of, of confrontation uh, due to a speaker on campus. And what if you were to, in, an, in another campus tour, show, for instance, um, some of the protests that happened several years ago when other uh, people would come on campus and provoke students and so forth. So you can see that this could all um, lead to the kind of memory around how students have organized um, how students have responded or even been listeners um, and witnesses to things on campus that sometimes are not necessarily uh, a part of the lore that the campus gives. Now, this fa final scene that we did, um, we did in front of the Social Science Building, which itself was renamed Social Science Building uh, from its pre previous name, Barrows Hall, right? So in that, we decided to put up the mural in its actual dimensions along the wall in um, the uh, one of the areas around the social science building. And so I'll play this last one and then we can uh, have a conversation. And this one, I think the volume must be really low. So you might want to raise the volume. Organized under the banner of the Third World Liberation Front and demanded that the university invest in culturally relevant and vital education for communities of color. 
Following a hunger strike, protesters won nine demands to secure the longevity and strength of the Ethnic Studies Department, improve student diversity, admonish student protesters, and secure long-term execution of the agreements reached. Among the demands was the agreement to install a mural in Barrows Hall. Protesters envisioned the mural as part of a shift in the visual language and culture of UC Berkeley campus. The creation and installation of the mural, however, remained unmet for two decades. In 2017, a committee convened to begin the process of soliciting artists to create a mural and finally meet this demand. The committee was composed of alumni, staff, faculty, and students. Committee members were Dylan Anselmo, Jordan Cisneros, Harvey Dong, Celia Herrera Rodriguez, Elisa Diana Huerta, Barbara Mumby Huerta, Dewey St. Germain, and Alex Tan. The committee eventually selected Artist Collective Trust Your Struggle to create the mural. Trust Your Struggle's vision for the mural echoed the iterative nature of organizing under the Third World Liberation Front banner, featuring images from across history and evoking ongoing and future struggles. The mural invokes contention and conflict as further complexities of TWLF organizing. The process of completing the mural, including arduous reflection, the feedback and revision, and the final project will be displayed in the place of contention. Images in the mural include complicated historical figures. Ultimately, the mural is an invitation to engage history, a conversation starter, and a teaching tool. So in this particular image, each one of these panels has audio embedded into it. So you can, on your phone or tablet, press the panel that you want to listen to, and it'll give you a description of who the figures are and what the representations are. So in this case, I uh, pressed the bottom middle panel with June Jordan and others, and that's what will be discussed um, in this last bit. Half of this panel consists of a group of weavers, including Rosemary Cambra. Rosemary, in the yellow shirt, is a tribal chairwoman of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. The Ohlone tribe are the indigenous people of the general Bay Area. Indigenous practice involves a relationship of respect between people and nature. This part of the mural commemorates the native tribes and promotes a return to a consciousness towards Earth. The lower half of this panel depicts three activists, from left to right. June Jordan, Lehman Lee Brightman, and Magdalena Mora. June Jordan was a poet, activist, and professor at UC Berkeley. Her efforts include her involvement with the feminists, LGBTQ+, anti-war, and civil rights movement. Lehman Brightman was a Native American activist and professor who founded the organization called United Native Americans to fight for decolonization and unity amongst indigenous. Last but not least, Magdalena Mora was a Chicana activist, feminist, and labor organizer. She fought for workers' rights through solidarity between Mexican workers in the United States and in Mexico. This panel exhibits the strength in unity and solidarity. So as you can see, each one of these panels will give you a description uh, in greater detail of the mural. Um, and you can imagine, uh, you've probably seen this if you've ever gone to um, some of the more official murals, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, museums, for instance, now you see this a lot in museums, where they'll have augmented reality as a way uh, to give you information. Or if you've ever heard, uh, or if you've ever used a, like, uh, hearing aid for um, when you're walking through a museum, like, uh, whether it be the Met or the Louvre uh, or the MoMA, any of these museums and so forth. Yeah, the audio tours. So in this case, you can use augmented reality and actually have, in a sense, the gallery available to you uh, anywhere that you go and learn about the art in this case. So, but in this case, what we're saying is this mural hasn't found a home uh, and its intended home is the social science building. And so what would it mean then to, for instance, have a place for it in that location, yeah? Um, it's actually being stored. So the panels themselves are not up anywhere. They're being stored. And the bureaucracy of the university is that there really isn't a, a place to put it because of its size. And uh, you, you can imagine in a university that says there's, there's a lack of space that um, such a mural is having a tough time finding a home in a sense, yeah? 
Um, I just want to thank real quick some of my uh, work studies who have um, followed me throughout this uh, kind of journey, uh, in particular, Sarai Montes and Jocelyn Vivaldo Hernandez and the rest of the Ethnic Studies Changemaker team. Um, let's open this up. Yeah, Greg, uh, and I'm wanting to hear some of your questions and comments. Um, and thank you so much for, um, yeah, for the invitation and just for having me talk to you all. Well, thank you, Pablo. This was a wonderful presentation as usual, and I'm so glad you're with us to speak on all these uh, historic and present issues and uh, contextualize them with a present that is still um, so unresolved. And uh, one right. thing that strikes me, I'm still, I'm still rolling my eyes at the fact that the university can't find room for a mural like that. Uh, it's, uh, it's very strange. But um, I wanted to... Um, <clears throat> foreground the questions of the students. Uh, we have four right now, and they're all good questions. And if you have any more questions for uh, Pablo, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, I guess you can also raise your hand, and uh, I'm not sure if we'll see that exactly. So the safest thing is to just post your question in the Q&A, and you can also just write in there, hey, I want to ask my question live, and I think we can turn, turn that audio on for you if you want to do that. So uh, the first question is by uh, Byron Yang, who says, how do you think stories shape our perception of different cultures? And in a way, that's a very broad question, but right. I think it bears repeating um, because it's a really deep question as well. How do you think stories shape our perception of different cultures? That's a, that's a great question, Byron. One of the, and the reason why, um, I, I, it's one of the first questions I ask myself. For me, um, especially because I'm, I'm a social movement scholar as well, that is, I've, I've looked at the question of what brings us together when our commonalities aren't as, um, as common <laughs> or, 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 or as noticeable. And it's the moment of encounter. And this is something that I've learned in, in working uh, in solidarity uh, with uh, indigenous social movements in Mexico, in particular the Zapatista movement, that the encounter is the place by which a place like the University of California should be, right? You come from wherever you're coming from, whether it be the state of California or other place throughout the United States or world, um, and the encounter happens not only in the classroom, but it happens while you're walking through Sproul, while you're going to class, in your dorms with your dorm, uh, dorm mates. And the, the place of encounter should be the place by which dialogue happens, not monologue, but dialogue, by which you can build difference in a more radical way than just through the lens of diversity and inclusion. That is, it's not about diversity in the way that um, you can put on a brochure that this campus is made up of so many different people from different communities, but what does it truly mean when you contact people from different communities and you resolve differences or you get into uh, discussions around what those differences mean in regards to power, in regards to the history of your community and what that means in, in, in the way that you're changed by those conversations. In that context, Stories that you tell are your knowledge base, are your data, as we say in the university. And you hold that. And you hold that in such a way that uh, you see yourself as an expert of what? Of your own reality and story and the stories of your community. And upon sh uh, sharing those, which is a such an important way of being vulnerable, right? Anytime you share anything of yourself or of your community, you show a part of you that's vulnerable, it, it builds the condition of the kind of um, intercultural change that we want to see in a place like UC Berkeley. And I think these stories that we can tell, for instance, are an invitation to think about a university, not in its official way, the way that it goes through several kind of um, way through different kind of media scapes of, and then it comes out as the official story, but more so the stories that people are inviting you to try to think through and understand uh, to give context to their uh, experiences, but also um, how they see themselves and, and how they see themselves becoming also um, whatever, they, whatever they're becoming. So I think um, I see stories in that way, right? As as active breathing forms of knowledge production, yeah, um, that all of you hold, and that I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping that kind of leads to where your question was asking at. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so next question would be about the platform and, and uh, the <clears throat> Adobe Aero. Uh, there's two questions along those lines. The first one is, is it possible from Adrian Enders? And it's, he asks, or they ask, is it possible to make the images used in the AR simulation blend in more with the surrounding with different shades and coloring? And I think that's a media-wise very interesting question because of course you don't know what the world looks like. It could be day, it could be night, it could be that's raining. Right. And uh, so what it's hard to integrate the images with the background uh, that is of course live because well, the background is live. And so any strategies for account accounting for that? Um, you know, Arrow, I, we've, Arrow's come a long way. I mean, I started using it maybe about three or four years ago. And I used it in a history class that I taught, history of the Southwest. And one of my students, uh, she constructed an Arrow uh, scene uh, of a life-size, if you can imagine this, life-size uh, reconstruction of Chicano Park in Barrio Logan in San Diego. And the reason why I find that almost, I'm, I'm kind of like laughing about this because if you've been to San Diego, you've been to Barrio Logan where you where um, Chicano Park is, it's, it's on pillars underneath the freeway, underneath the bridge, the Coronado Bridge going into, uh, in, in San Diego. So she, she found the measurements and everything and um, it, it, at this point, you, you know, I don't have, for instance, um, the knowledge to do 3D imaging, but you can do 3D imaging with Arrow. Uh, but she created almost just 2D of, of, of these pillars, placed it like in the middle of her neighborhood, and a walkthrough looking at diff the different murals on each of the pillars of the, um, of the park. And in, in terms of um, creating it to blend into the environment, you could by using, I think, uh, different uh, applications that um, can, can alter the images. But here's the thing. Um, there is a politics, for instance, in cropping. There is a politics in, in uh, changing, for instance, archival documents. Uh, for instance, like some of the Getty images we we that we used, or some of the other images that we found um, in different archives, that that you you also have to take into account. What does it mean to to change it to blend in? We would love to have that. For instance, to think about from coming down from Sprawl Hall and seeing the audience from there's an image of Martin Luther King speaking, and you only see his back. And then you see the entire crowd on Sproul Plaza. Coming down from Sproul Hall, you can probably create it as close in, in, in its kind of measuring and scale, mm -hmm. where it actually looks like it's, but it, it would be in black and white, but it as if you're in 1967. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you would just have to be very careful with the scaling, if anything. Yeah, thanks. And it's, it's an important point that you raised that when you have a historical document, there's only so much you want to do to it to change it because it is meant to be different. And sometimes the friction at the edge between the artifact and the landscape is actually where the real meaning unfolds. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a there's a question about that that's coming up soon. Um, uh, but we have one more platform question. Cameron Casale, Casale asks, uh, does this platform only pick one core event to show per location, or can you pack more locations in in one? Uh, <clears throat> can you have multiple events in one location? I know that certain aspects they say on uh, that certain spaces on campus have been home to many major historical events, and so how could you pack multiple events into one given location? <clears throat> yeah, uh, you know. It's it. There's so many. I, as you're, I think your students are mentioning or or asking. Cameron, there's, so, yeah. there's so many questions around these things yet, um, and for us, it, it it brings up consistent problems and questions, which I love. Right, any project, especially that you're just trying out. In this case, where where it's an idea, it's a response to something, will always appear with questions. And that's actually a good thing, not a bad thing, but a good thing. Why? 
because those questions don't always have resolution, but they do produce other questions by which you can think about and and find people to be in dialogue to see where where you can create even a, a much more collective uh, project or or um, image or or kind of vision for this kind of uh, retelling or or remembering of of this counter memory. Yeah, um, I'm kind of thinking about it that way versus the uh, the limitations because the limitations are. Some of them are profound, but some of them are more around the technical side, right? Um, and, and AR, like virtual reality, I think can 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 be able to give us a, another way of storytelling. I mean, I think Greg, we've been talking about this, right? How you you can you can do this, um, and there's this thin line, I think, be, be uh, for it to not to become so gimmicky, right? Um, mm -hmm. And to actually make a political uh, to be provocative, to to make a political uh, position known, but also to tell story as we've been uh, very much talking about, yeah. So, and so for me, to be able to talk about clandestine histories, stories that can only be told maybe to some and not to others. Yeah, and and the other thing, you know, just to, to answer uh, Cameron's concern a little bit, of course, everybody gets to make that decision depending on the project they're working on. So if you're doing one version of um, campus tour, <clears throat> maybe Cameron might go in and do a musician's tour of campus or a queer tour through campus That's or right. whatever it is. And uh, it would be a completely different tour. And there's no limit to how many uh, different tours we can make go through one location and uh, may they all prosper, right? Many many flowers can bloom there, literally. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, they, and there, there are ways to, um, as some of your students are mentioning, I think, for for them for the encounters between these different uh, tours or stories to come together, uh, to, to 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 come together not just by placing them together, but but because ma many of these movements weren't just kind of uh, unidirectional, they had and are, were connected to so many uh, other movements and inspired so many other movements. So I think. That way, you it, it might represent itself, I think, even in uh, future projects for students or others who want to pursue this. Lisa, you have your hand raised? There's two hands raised, actually, oh. Lisa, and then there's also an attendee. And so let's start with Lisa, though, yeah. Hi. Such a fantastic presentation, Pablo. Um, thank you for coming and sharing. I was curious, you, you mentioned change makers several times, and I was curious, um, what is this? When we talk about change making, what is essential in that? Like, what are the processes involved? And you also talk about social movement and and what it, what's the role of movement in change making? You know, for us, uh, it's been what our motto: uh, scaffolding stories, building communities. That is, the power of storytelling uh, to build community. Mm. And my my vision in in this ethnic studies changemaker project which right now includes a, a functional podcast studio where students just like students that are uh, uh, listening to this can use uh, listening to this uh, uh, seminar can use to tell their stories um, but also use technologies like augmented reality and, ver and other mixed reality to tell and 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 again encounter other stories um, not just on this campus, but wherever they may be from, that that they build communities, in particular uh, communities that um, function as a response to something that we see ever more growing, which is um, the constant push to alienate e each mm -hmm. other. And one of the things I always tell my students in my classes is that what I also notice, and this is part of observing, and paying attention and becoming good listeners and observers of things is that when many of us walk through a, a crowded area, like for instance, uh, Sproul Plaza, that we walk there, but are afraid to bump into each other, see each other. Many of us are looking down at our phones. Many of us are paying attention to so many different things. And part of that atomization that happens, I think is part of what we might in a sense, analyze or 
or conceptualize as the kind of neoliberal condition that we find ourselves in, in the neoliberal moment, that atomization of the individual uh, apart from community, the response, the collective response to that. Um, and, and I'm looking at social movements as an embodiment of that, right? As, mm -hmm. as, as the collection of that, as the circulation of community um, in response to whether it be state violence, uh, in response to whether it be, for instance, in this case, um, as your graduate student instructors are and researchers and postdocs are fighting for a livable wage uh, to be able to be able to live in a more, one of the most expensive regions in the world, right? Um, and to produce knowledge that will reshape our understanding of things. So part of that, I think, is um, creating epistemic shifts but also um, material um, tremors and ruptures, right? Uh, how to be able to produce those types of long lasting communities that can take us out of what this sickness is, that the sickness of alienation and atomization, I think. Uh, thanks, and, we have a lot of more questions to get to, so let's be really- <laughs> I just wanted to just quickly just respond to say that I, I'm really hearing that it's about the listening and the telling together. So yes, thank you. I think those are tools that we can take from it. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to give the audio to Jin, who raised their hand. I'm going to, uh, um, there you go. I think, Jin, you can speak now if you want to try and ask your question directly. I love your, I love your screen, uh, Jin. Go ahead. <laughs> Jin's still on mute. <clears throat> well, maybe while Jin is getting ready, I'm going to ask a question that Emily man mentioned twice. Emily Garcia, how do you think it's, what do you think it's going to take in order to put up that mural, because now that they barely have space for Latino students, in the sense that we barely have a reasonably sized center now. Right. You know. You know what, Greg? Um, as, as someone who's who's met and with the committee and so forth, we used to have a location right inside the social science building, but the fire marshal said, after first agreeing that it no longer could be there because there was a, a there was kind of fear of it falling down. Okay, I, I can understand that, especially you know. Northern California, kind of the seismic danger, et cetera. I think sometimes, um, sometimes the fear of hanging it up is bigger than the fear of it falling down, you know? Exactly. So so I'm always kind of also, you know, that kind of skeptic of like, is it is there something more to this? Yeah. Um, and and it's hard uh, because Berkeley, it's, it's, you, you think about Berkeley in a couple of ways. You can think about Berkeley in the way that, um, it, what it gives uh, time and effort to and what it doesn't give time and effort to. And to find the location, for instance, for a mural that uh, was one of the major gains of the 1999 strike um, is probably not on the priority list of the university. Um, and I think uh, a mural that tells such an important history, not just of ethnic studies on this campus, but more so of native history in this region, the native or original peoples of this land, because I think Trust Your Struggle Collective did such an amazing job of um, paying respect and bringing in the stories, again, the storytelling and meaning behind the university. They literally, I think, conceptualized a way of, of decolonizing the university by saying that this university is more than the brick and mortar. It is a lonely land. And so I think in that context, um, you can see this mural um, hopefully with uh, student, faculty, staff, community uh, pressure that it can find a place where people can vi uh, visibly see it, not just somewhere where no one can see it, and then dialogue and, and, and have that kind of encounter that I'm, I'm suggesting that is necessary for the, the kind of building of community on this campus, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And, and we've tried like the MLK building and things like that. It's just a very difficult, uh, you know, proposition. Um, and I don't know, I mean, it's it's a costly one too, but I feel like you, like you said, um, it, it should be done. It should have been done. It shouldn't have taken 22 years for it to That's happen. Right. Yeah. And, and the blank wall is not a neutral wall. <clears throat> That's right. 
Um, it also says something. Okay, so uh, speaking of history here, Wesley Zhang asks, what would you say is the most striking difference between the current strike and the civil rights protests at Berkeley in the 1960s? Um, and by the uh, the most recent strike, I'm, I'm thinking you're referring to the uh, labor strike. Yes, the current strike, yeah. Um, you know, I think, first of all, the importance of strikes as the withholding of labor, that you are more than um, your work or your your employment. One of the one of the and I, I don't know if this is the probably the most dangerous things to say, Greg, but one of the things I tell my students is withholding your labor is one of the most important acts you can do. You have movements all over the world that have done this. Farmers in Korea, um, farmers in Central America and Mexico, indigenous communities um, in, in, you know, in Africa, in different places of the world. Uh, the zero work movement that happened in the 60s and 70s in Italy, um, all kinds of movements that have happened around stopping things. Why? Because within this um, kind of neoliberal capitalist uh, uh, global structure, labor is still one of the main way of, um, of, of, of production and of, of wealth, of giving wealth to others. And so when you withhold your labor, whether it's by slowing down work or not working at all, the impact of that also resonates with other calls for um, basic human rights, um, gender, uh, gendered rights, other forms of rights uh, and grievances that happen. How do I know this? Because the 1960s civil rights movement is a product of black labor movement in the 40s, 30s, especially around sharecroppers and other workers in the South. If we look at the work of Martin Luther King prior to being assassinated, he was supporting and showing support to sanitary workers, bus drivers, all kinds of different workers. So the connection between labor strikes and civil rights has always been connected in so many different ways so as to mirror and give, um, I think, um, affinity to, like to, to grow in mass around the question of uh, dignified work, especially when we look at the gender division of labor um, and other measures of the, the forms of division of labor, yeah? Yeah, so um, uh, there was a, 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 an element in the question where the student was asking, Wesley was asking, what is the difference? Not ah, okay. And so, so I think uh, you know one thing that strikes me about this current strike is that it's not uh, focused on any particular race or gender. It's not a it's not a race or gender strike. It's really a class strike. And uh, this idea that uh, you but are it, able but but we always remember that it impacts certain groups more than others. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so there's there's a but any any thoughts about that? That I, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And and it and even even within that, we see that certain units on campus, um, you know, readers, for instance, get paid less than uh than than GSIs. I mean, when we look at this division, um, and and what your graduate student instructors, where they come from, whether they come from outside of the country, within, from different communities, where uh that that work plus they have to work another job. I've talked to many graduate students. I mean, when I was a graduate student, I had to work other jobs. Um, it it it's because the university, as a public right, um, has now become one of the most profitable businesses in the state. And because because of that, I think students are saying, if it is that profitable, then it should be no problem to pay um, some of its major. Uh, workforce um, a livable wage. Okay, well, thank you. And so Tara is asking, Tara Kulshestra, Kulshresta is asking three questions. And uh, I want to sort of bring those together. Um, first is a seeking, she, they're seeking an example. Can you please give an example of a time when you've seen that someone's ethnic or cultural background has caused them to have a worldview different from your own? 
And then the next question is, is the administration subvert supportive of your work? And in a way, that's an answer to your first question, right? Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the third question, uh, have you ever considered asking administration to change their tour and create different tours? But maybe we should start with that example first. So an example of uh, uh, someone's ethnic background uh, causing them to have a different worldview from your own. I think so. You know, again, when you talk about intercultural exchange and encounter, the result of that is always a reflection of how you've been changed, what resonated with you that has made you understand something um, or yourself differently. Culture is not static and not changing, neither is it uh, somehow monolithic in its, construct, in its construct, right? And we are constantly being influenced and impacted by each other. And so I think in that context, we can see that um, places of encounter here, I wanna be very clear that places of encounter sometimes can be um, jagged edged and, and rough, but it's the encounter, the, the very nature of vulnerability of some, someone saying, I'm sharing my story with you, my story of struggle in this case, right? Or my story of how I came to this campus and how I've been able to navigate it. How you change from listening to that could mean you could disregard it, or you can also venture in that same encounter and, and understand your privilege and position in the university uh, and measure where it's at to understand your understanding of where you sit and situate yourself, right? And it's not so much so that you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes, per se but so much as you understand what shoes you wear <laughs> uh, and, and understand that you sharing who you are is just as important as you understanding who others are and what they're becoming. So it's that intercultural exchange that's so crucial at a moment where most of that intercultural aspect has been now bottled and packaged for us um, and given to us in very commodified ways, right? Um, and I feel like this university should attempt to try to build more of that in, in, in not so much what we've seen more institutionalized in corporate spaces, but also universities around diversity and inclusion. Yeah, so this makes me think about the conversation we had earlier about renaming our campus. And, you know, I pointed out, uh, like, like, you know, that uh, George Berkeley was, an, was a philosopher right. who, who came up with um, some, some ideas that are, uh, that informed things like manifest destiny and uh, justification of certain uh, types of slavery and plantation work. And, and so when we think about renaming buildings and so forth, uh, maybe we should rename the whole campus. But um, when, when we talked about that, you had a very interesting response. Uh, and uh, I wanted uh, to, to uh, ask you uh, what you thought about renaming the campus. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. It's, it's the, and we, I remember us having a little bit of a conversation around this, that uh, it, it's not so much, although I think um, there's strong organizing and a, a ways of thinking about this kind of dialogue that happens around renaming um, that can uh, surface a, a lot of hurt and tra generational trauma, um, especially when talking about um, the role of the university in Berkeley or or in the, in in the region and so forth, because university is a position, especially in in a settler colonial context, is a position of power that that ushers in a very narrow understanding of of a, a particular epistemic perspective of the world, and renaming something, there's power in that, especially in in the organizing to rename it. That is, that in that organizing, in that movement towards that, you have conversations around not so much what would be the appropriate name, but how to uh, dislodge its position of power, what gives it meaning. 
to surface questions of memory and of the past and to find ways of healing that are for many different communities and at different, different levels. So there's not an easy solution to that. But I understand that the conversations um, are intense. And I'd rather have these kinds of dialogues than, than not have them at all and so, see it as, as somehow it just is what it, it, it is how it is. Or, it, you know, it, that's not necessarily an answer to the way that um, we understand the history of the founding of this city and the founding of this university. Um, and its impact that it's had not only on um, the original communities and peoples of this land, but also on um, other communities and peoples that have also been impacted. Again, I'm born and raised in Berkeley, and I understand closely what Berkeley is and isn't, especially when it comes to it pushing out a large part of its Mexican and Latino population and Black population um, in a ever more impossible to live in city. All of these things I think are connected to the broader nature of uh, what makes the city what it is. And, it, and I think reaching all the way to its history is too, right? Thank you, that is a perfect way to end. And uh, Pablo, I will certainly vote for you should you run for mayor of Berkeley and implement that into uh, real life. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for your amazing thoughts and reflections and uh, uh, inspirations and continued uh, effort to uh, bring us into dialogue with each other in ways that we uh, didn't expect and that we that are so essential for our common thriving. So thank you so much. And I invite your students, if they want to continue this dialogue, they could always email me or they could, and if they ever wanted to start their own podcast around any of these questions or just and so forth, let us know. Uh, uh, the website is ssbc.berkeley.edu and they could always sign up uh, to come and record or just to see some of the other projects that we're working on. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, uh, I wish you a great fall break and we will have no section on Friday because of the strike, of course, and we will um, resume um, uh, after after a uh, fall break. Elisa, with asynchronous, just an asynchronous class on Tuesday, which will send assignments out. But thank yeah. you, Pablo. Fantastic. Of have course, a great thank holiday. Thank you all for the, always for the invitation. Like I said, I will always say yes to you all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh,